Race, Power Dynamics, and the Court's Decision in McCleskey, presented by Nick Murphy. Introduction and Thesis. The study, this presentation is based on, utilizes critical discourse analysis to display the power dynamics conveyed in the dialogue between justices and counsel during the McCleskey oral argument, resulting in the devaluation of empirical evidence and the defendant's claims ignoring racial bias concerning capital punishment cases in the legal system, and maintaining the status quo. Why a CDA study on the McCleskey oral argument? A gap is filled by conducting an exploratory case study utilizing critical discourse analysis to examine the McCleskey oral argument to uncover language used by justices that undermine empirical evidence and elevates those in power concerning racial hierarchies and race in the legal system. The framework of the study is critical race theory. Critical race theory has recently become a relevant and polarizing topic. However, what is CRT and why is it such a controversial topic to some? Professors Bell and Degato describe CRT as a collective of academic scholars who develop scholarly legal research ideolo ideology ideologically geared toward combating racial discrimination and hierarchies of racial oppression, primarily focused on systemic and institutional issues perpetuated by the legal system. In other words, CRT is an academic legal theory that posits that racism is systematically ingrained, maintained, and normalized by our institutions in the legal system. The methodology of the study conducted was a uh, research design exploratory case study. The study utilized an exploratory case study approach and speech analysis methodology to analyze the McCleskey v. Camp oral argument. Why an exploratory case study on McCleskey? As confirmed by the Baldus study, McCleskey was a historic case that displayed a racial disparity concerning death sentences in Georgia's criminal justice system. Exploratory case studies are ideal for analyzing judicial opinions due to the emphasis on a narrow research area and highly structured research. This type of study correlates closely to the characteristics and elements of a judicial decision and is widely applied concerning their research. Methods would be a critical discourse analysis. Critical discourse analysis, or CDA, is appropriate to examine language and use by analyzing the dialogue between justices in the majority of McCleskey and counsel during oral, oral argument. CDA is prime for analyzing continuous dialogue, both oral and written. This analysis is ideal for legal, f ideal for the legal field, and is ripe with written briefs and oral arguments. CDA is primarily focused on how words or speech convey power dynamics, such as how power flows within society, how power is conveyed through language, and how language keeps power structures and the status quo in place. Ultimately. Critical discourse analysis is a prime method for examining the McCleskey Waller argument, considering the premise of McCleskey and this article's CRT framework. Ideally, the aim is to gain a deeper understanding of the power dynamics concerning justice's decision-making process and if implicit racial bias is a contributing factor. So why the McCleskey Waller argument? What's the relevance? McCleskey brought forth 8th and 14th Amendment constitutional challenges, citing racial discrimination and arbitrary use of the death penalty based on the findings of the Baldus study. Due to racial discrimination and racial disparities in Georgia's capital sentencing structure being the focal point of the McCleskey case, the McCleskey oral argument is a prime data source to examine in order to understand the power dynamics of the court and if justices in the majority perhaps suffered from implicit racial bias in their decision making. What is the Baldus study? The crux of the McCleskey decision hinged on the Baldus study, a groundbreaking in-depth and systematic statistical analysis of Georgia's capital sentencing structure. 
Dubbed the Charging and Sentencing Study, this study was a more finely tuned iteration of the procedural reform study and focused on 2,500 murder or non-negligent manslaughter cases in Georgia. Additionally, the study focused on decisions concerning grand jury indictments, prosecutorial plea bargaining, jury guilt trial, prosecutorial prosecutorial discretion when pursuing the death penalty after a guilty verdict and jury penalty trial sentencing. In short, the study allowed for an in-depth analysis of emerging racial disparities and a comprehensive look at the degree to which racial bias permeates Georgia's capital punishment system. In Justice Brennan, uh, the findings of the Baldus study, in Justice Brennan's words, quote, blacks who kill whites are sentenced to death at nearly 22 times the rate of blacks who kill blacks and more than seven times the rate of whites who kill blacks, unquote. And another uh, quote by Justice Brennan, quote, in addition, prosecutors seek the death penalty for 70% of black defendants with white victims, but only 15% of black defendants with black victims and only 19% of white defendants with black victims, unquote. Similarly, according to Bowers, after controlling for 230 correlates, Professor Baldus' study concluded, quote, that the killers of white victims were significantly more likely indeed 4.3 times more likely than those who kill blacks to receive the death penalty in Georgia. Uh, at the time of making this presentation, uh, the analysis and findings section of this study were still being conducted. So we're going to pivot the remainder of this presentation to a brief discussion on CRT what it is, what it isn't, and why it is important. The existing legal system and the mainstream legal scholarship as well are not colorblind, although they pretend to be. Despite the pretense of neutrality, the system has always worked to the disadvantage of people of color and continues to do so. People of color are more likely to be convicted, to serve more time, to suffer arbitrary arrest, and deprivation of liberty and property. A pervasive but unconscious racism infects the legal system. Douglas E. Lidowitz. A bit of a background on CRT. Harvard Law School's first African-American tenured professor and one of the leading scholars in the development of critical race theory, Bell, described CRT as a body of legal scholarship whose members share the ideological goal of addressing the struggles of racism and oppression specifically as institutionalized by law. Delgado, another leading scholar of CRT, conveys the or origins of critical race theory as an academic field of mostly lawyers and legal scholars who notice the gains of the civil rights era stalled and, in many cases, regressed. As Delgado puts it, this small group of lawyers and legal scholars aim to provide new approaches to combat subtle, and unconscious forms of deeply entrenched institutional racism. In other words, CRT is an academic theoretical framework for understanding power asymmetry and structural bias. It is taught primarily at the law school and, uni and university levels. One of the central ideas behind CRT is the ingrained nature of racism in American society and that over time those living with it become accustomed to it inferring that the notion of equality and laws compelling racial equality are only able to address the most obvious forms of racial injustice. However, these laws are insufficient in addressing the more subtle microaggressions and implicit biases that affect people of color on a continuous basis. The systemic racial inequality in today's sprawling criminal justice system is the successor to the discriminatory punishment of dissidents in the legalized differential punishment of minorities. Eliza Kova. Implicit, bi implicit racial bias. What, so what is it? Well, Kova highlights the evolution of racial inequality within the criminal justice system, suggesting that racial discrimination is not going away. 
it has just taken different forms. Prime examples include implicit racial bias and the disproportionate application of the death penalty against African Americans. Rose describes implicit bias as an automatic preference or predisposition stemming from a person's subconscious preconceived opinions or attitudes. Rose explains that implicit bias can have adverse effects. More specifically, it may contribute to behavior that is discriminatory, even if that is not one's overt intention. In short, implicit bias is a central theme of CRT and a contributing factor in racial discrimination, which permeates all levels of the criminal justice system. Implicit bias involves all the subconscious feelings, perceptions, attitudes, and stereotypes that have developed as a result of prior influences and imprints. It is an automatic positive or negative preference for a group based on one's subconscious thoughts. However, implicit bias does not require animus. It only requires knowledge of a stereotype to produce discriminatory actions. U.S. Department of Justice. Racial disparities in the death penalty. Although the number of Anglo-Americans, white people, who face execution is higher in comparison to African Americans since 1977 in the United States, African Americans are disproportionately affected. Moran highlights the execution of 295 African American defendants for killing an Anglo American victim compared to just 21 Anglo American defendants for killing an African American victim. The findings of the Baldus study in McCleskey parallel the broader racial disparities mentioned above. The Baldus study confirmed that a Georgia the Baldus study confirmed that in Georgia, black defendant slash white victim cases advanced to capital punishment trials at roughly five times the amount of black defendant slash black victim cases and over three times the amount of white defendant slash black victim cases. In an effort to provide a complete picture in context, it is important to provide a brief historical overview of racial injustice in America. The timeline has a direct correlation and is relevant to the concept of CRT. So here we have a visual um, of racial discrimination in the United States, starting with slavery in the early 1600s, uh, segregation, and mass incarceration to the current day. Slavery in the Americas. From 1525 to 1866, 12.5 million Africans were captured and ripped from their homeland to be enslaved in North and South America via the transatlantic slave trade. The first enslaved Africans arrived in the British colonies in North and South America in 1619. From that year forward, almost 300 years of slavery followed in what would soon become the United States of America. Post-Civil War Reconstruction in Black Codes Prior to emancipation, slave codes existed. These were the inspiration for black codes. Black codes were laws created and implemented to be more subtle forms of the overt social controls of slavery. In short, slave codes were deemed void by the emancipation and the 13th Amendment. However, it didn't stop proponents of slavery from continuing their bigotry. Simply black codes replaced slave codes in an effort to maintain the power dynamics set in place by slavery. Black codes were the precursor to Jim Crow segregation laws. Examples of black codes uh, black codes include no colored person. Persons have the right to vote, hold office, or sit on juries in the state. That's in Tennessee, or was in Tennessee. No person or no person of color can be an artisan, mechanic, or shopkeeper, or pursue any trade or business besides farming, manual labor, or domestic service. That was in South Carolina. Only white men can serve on juries, hold office, and vote in any state, county, or municipal election. That was in Texas. Jim Crow segregation in the United States. Jim Crow refers to segregation laws primarily found in the South that enforced racial segregation from the periods of the Reconstruction era in the late 1800s to the Civil Rights era of the 1950s and 60s. One case law example includes Plessy v. Ferguson, which codified at the state level the concept of separate but equal. Not until nearly 60 years later, in Brown v. Board of Education, was the ruling in Plessy overturned. 
subsequent Supreme Court of the United States decisions and federal legislation during the civil rights era progressively dismantled Jim Crow segregation laws. Notable civil and human rights leaders assassinated. It is compelling to also note that several prominent proponents of the Civil Rights Act and Human Rights Movement were assassinated shortly after it was proposed and passed into law. John F. Kennedy in 1963, he initially proposed the Civil Rights Act shortly before his assassination. His successor, President Johnson, signed it into law in 1964. Malcolm X in 1965 was assassinated. He was the prominent leader of the Black Power Movement. He advocated for a broader approach in favor of more than just civil rights, X advocated for human rights. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968, probably one of the most prominent and influential leaders of the civil rights movement and crucial to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Shortly after his success, MLK shifted his focus to the Poor People's Campaign. Not soon after, he was assassinated by a sniper in Memphis, Tennessee, the state where the KKK originated. Current day racial injustice and mass incarceration in the United States. Fast forward and here it would appear racial, just, racial injustices are still as prevalent today as they were in the past. Unfortunately laws geared at guarding against racial inequality and discrimination have largely been inadequate in overcoming the entrenched systemic racism ingrained in this country mm -hmm. since its founding. Uh, some key stats w on racial injustice and mass incarceration in the United States would include African Americans make up just 13% of the general population in the United States, yet African Americans make up 38% of the prison and jail populations. Uh, incarceration rates per 100,000 people, African Americans 200, 300, 2,306 versus Anglo-Americans, 450. Arrest rates per 100,000. African-Americans, 6,109 versus Anglo-Americans, 2,795. 48% of prisoners serving life or life without parole are African-American, and 41% of prisoners on death row are African-American. Even under the most sophisticated death penalty statutes, race continues to play a major role in determining who shall live and who shall die. Perhaps it should not be surprising that the biases and prejudices that infect society generally would influence the determination of who is sentenced to death. Justice Harry Blackman. Here we are over 400 years later, and discrimination and racism still persist in the United States. It would be fair to ask, especially considering the statistics on African Americans in mass incarceration, has racial inequality and the social controls of white supremacy truly been addressed? Have we really rid ourselves of slavery, or has it merely taken different forms, such as mass incarceration and the disproportionate executions of African Americans by our criminal justice system? Are these phenomena all by chance? Or is it all a result of a criminal justice system intentionally or unintentionally maintaining a power structure deeply rooted in a notion of white supremacy, which spans back to the very inception of this nation? All right, that's a wrap. I'm Nick Murphy. That was my presentation. Thanks for listening. Um, congrats, class of 2020, uh, 2023, and charge on.